Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. I am so excited that you are here and really excited to be here. I'm hopeful that today's talk is helpful for everyone. My name is Grant Smith, and I'm one of the palliative care doctors at Stanford. I want to start by thanking all of our community partners who have really helped make this session happen. So thank you so much to Cancer Care Point, Bay Area Cancer Connections, New Hope Chinese Cancer Care Foundation, and Latinas Contra Cancer. I also want to thank our interpreters, Amada, Miriam, Grace, and Zoe, for helping make this session available in Spanish and Mandarin. What a wonderful thing. We are so excited. Thank you so, so much. Uh, before we jump in, just want to make sure everybody is where they need to be to be able to hear in your preferred language. If you haven't already, just click the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen, then select the language that matches you to enter the correct room. Today, if you'd like to ask a question, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. This will open a new dialog box where you can type in your question. You're welcome to type questions in English, Spanish, or Chinese, and we'll be working with the interpreters to interpret these questions at the end. Once people have started to ask questions, you can like a question by clicking on the thumbs up icon and this will let us know that a lot of people may have the same question and we'll try to answer those most popular questions first. With that, I just wanna go over an outline for our time today. We're going to start with an introduction from our co-hosting organizations. Next, we'll talk about what is palliative care. Then we'll review what is pain to really help us lay the groundwork or where we'll spend most of our time today talking about how we can work to relieve and manage pain. And then finally, we'll talk about some practical advice about how to talk to your doctor about your pain. So let's get started uh, just by hearing from uh, Bay Area Cancer Connections, who's gonna tell us a little bit about their services. Okay, thank you, Dr. Smith. I'm Colleen Carvalho, the Director of Programs and Services at Bay Area Cancer Connections. And as an organization, we at BACC support anyone affected by breast or ovarian cancer with free personalized services that inform and empower. Many of our services are open to those with any type of cancer. Right now, the majority of our programs are taking place through Zoom. Our support takes many forms and includes support groups, counseling, financial assistance programs, wellness classes, cancer information and education, and much more. One in-person services, one in-person service we are currently offering is a socially distanced outdoor boutique where we can help clients find things like wigs, hats, scarves, bras, and prosthetics. All of BACC's programs and services are provided free of charge, and we hope you will visit our website to find out more. And now we'll move on to the next organization. All right, next up is New Hope Chinese Cancer Care Foundation. Hi, thank you, Dr. Smith. And yeah, this is Tina from uh, New Hope Chinese Cancer Care uh, Foundation. I'm the executive director. And we serve Chinese cancer patients and their family since 2013. And we offer uh, many services and programs. As you can see from the slide, we do the transportation service. We have, uh, as an oncologist, that's a free oncology consultation. And we also have support groups, community education. Uh, for more information, please feel free to visit our website, www.newhopecancer.org. And um, yeah, so um, any question you can call us. We are partially open from Tuesday to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday morning. So of course, when you need a service, because for Chinese cancer patient, um, in addition to fighting the cancer, they also have to face in the language barrier and cultural difference. So uh, for Chinese cancer patient, please come to us as if you need a help. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
next we'll hear from Cancer CarePoint. Hi there, I'm Morgan. I'm the Director of Programs for Cancer CarePoint. We believe that no one should have to face cancer alone. So we offer all of our services at no cost to cancer patients, survivors, caregivers, and family members. We are currently offering most of our programs online, so you can check out our website, which is cancercarepoint.org, and you can join in on exercise classes, cooking classes, we offer support groups, we also offer individual and family counseling, and we do currently offer an online uh, wig boutique and hat boutique for anybody impacted by cancer-related hair loss. So feel free to give us a call as well, 408-402-6611. Thank you so much. And next we'll hear from Latinas Contra Cancer. Hi, my name is Darcy. I am from Latinas Contra Cancer. We're very excited to be here talking about this important issue. Our organization is located in downtown San Jose. We serve the entire county, San Mateo County, and um, pieces of San Benito and going down south. We offer health education, cancer health education events, wellness events, presentations on cancer prevention and cancer. We also offer patient navigation and patient advocacy. This looks like if you need help getting a screening, if you need help accessing mammograms, colonoscopies, any um, PAPs, any of those things. If you also need help with case management through clinic or hospital settings and community resource navigation, particularly in this time when we know the Latino community has been so disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and the shelter in place, a lot of our work has been helping our clients, both of whom are, are cancer patients and many who are not, but those seeking prevention, navigate the devastating impacts of the pandemic and the shelter in place. We also offer survivor support, our monthly support groups. We have an English support group and a Spanish support group, as well as a children's support group. We offer one-on-one -on -one therapy, a survivor community calendar of events, web website with some resources, and we have a phenomenal, wonderful, lovely boutique that has uh, wigs, mastectomy garments, breast prostheses, we, have, we do fittings there. All of our services are in English and Spanish. We're still taking appointments. We've never stopped for our boutique. Um, we also do research and advocacy, um, as well as put on a few signature events throughout the year. Our main mission is to create equitable and just access to the health and healthcare system for the Latino community around issues of cancer and cancer prevention. Our name is Latinas Contra Cancer, but we do serve men and women and all different types of cancer. So please, if you need any support at all, reach out to us at 408-280-8011, or you can email us there on the email listed or check out our website. But we would be happy to help as all of us navigate this, this time. Great, thank you so much. And again, thank you so much to all the co-hosting organizations. It's really an honor to get to be here with everyone. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and move forward and we'll talk about what is palliative care. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a palliative care doctor and just want to acknowledge that many people do not know or have not heard of palliative care. And there are also many misconceptions about palliative care. So I just wanted to start by reviewing a definition to help clarify what palliative care is. So palliative care is specialized health care for people living with a serious illness. This type of care focuses on providing relief from the symptoms and the stress of the illness. And the goal is to improve the quality of life for both the patient and the family. Palliative care is provided by a specially trained team, and palliative care specialists work together with a patient's other doctors to provide an extra layer of support. Palliative care is based on the needs of the patient and not on a prognosis. It's appropriate at any age and at any point in a serious illness, and it can be delivered alongside curative treatment. So part of the reason I, as a palliative care doctor, 
and talking today is that we really help to work manage patient symptoms like pain. In palliative care, we operate as a team. We believe that it takes a team to support patients and their families because we want to address not only physical symptoms, but also to meet the psychological, social, and spiritual needs. And because the expertise needed to address each of these issues, our team includes doctors and nurses, social workers, chaplains, and medical assistants. And just to tell you a little bit more about how we work as a team in palliative care, while everyone shares in some of the work, different team members have different areas of focus. So the doctors and nurses often are focusing on managing bothersome symptoms like pain and can help with prescribing medications. We also can help patients and families with medical decisions or advanced healthcare planning. We also help coordinate with the uh, patient's other doctors on, uh, on the care team. Social workers often help provide emotional support through things like regular phone calls or telehealth visits. They can help provide caregiver support to your loved ones or other caregivers in the home. They can help with obtaining medical equipment if that's needed in the home, like a hospital bed or a wheelchair. They can also help talk through financial concerns and may be able to help in looking for financial assistance when needed. Our chaplains help to provide spiritual support. They can help in addressing existential concerns, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. They can offer prayers and blessings. Many people think that palliative care and hospice are the same thing. However, palliative care and hospice are not the same. Uh, as we've talked about already, palliative care is a large and broad field that's focused on symptom management and helping make sure the care plan focuses on what matters most to patients. And as I mentioned before, palliative care can see people at any age and at any stage of an illness and can be involved even when someone's getting treatment that will cure their illness. Hospice, on the other hand, is a form of palliative care that is meant for individuals at the very end of life and who choose to focus primarily on their comfort more than focusing on life prolonging treatments. So I just wanted to provide that information about the perspective I'm coming from from palliative care and that will be the lens that uh, we're looking at managing pain. Again, please feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A box and we'll come back to answer those questions at the end. With that introduction, let's talk about pain, why we're all here today. We'll start just by asking the question, what is pain? Pain is an unpleasant sensation in the body and pain really acts as a signal that there is injury or damage to the body. Pain is a common experience for people living with cancer. In one study, 66% of patients with metastatic or advanced cancer reported having pain. And then slightly more than half of patients with cancer reported experiencing pain while they were getting anti-cancer treatment. Now, I really present this information and say this to affirm that if you are having pain from cancer, you're not alone. And you really should feel welcome to let your doctors know if you're having this sort of pain. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Let's think for just a second together to consider how do we feel pain? This will help us really provide a foundation for our approach to how we can alleviate or reduce pain. So nerves throughout our body can sense when there is injury or damage to part of the body. And those injuries trigger the nerves to send a signal out that the body is injured. 
These signals travel through multiple nerves, up through the spinal cord, and ultimately to the brain. And in the brain, that signal is received and causes us to perceive the sensation of pain. However, we all know that pain is much more than just a physical sensation that's caused by nerve signals. Pain is an emotional experience. We know that pain causes fear and anxiety, and that's actually a normal physiologic, biologic response to have an emotional reaction to pain. In fact, when those pain signals from the nerves reach the brain, those signals are sent both to the part of the brain that processes that sensation or the sensory information, but it also sends that signal to the part of the brain that processes emotions and is involved in decision making. For patients and families who are living with a cancer diagnosis, we also know that pain can be scary and sometimes causes worry that the cancer might be getting worse. We know that pain is a subjective experience. You know, unfortunately, there's no blood test or device that can directly measure pain. So managing pain is, is done through a relationship between a patient and a provider. And sometimes that means it can be challenging because there can be misunderstandings or especially when working across languages or cultural differences, sometimes it can be difficult to, to talk about. Pain can be challenging because everyone shows their pain in a different way. Some people may cry or call out when they're in pain, while others may be silent. I bring up some of these issues because I know that many people worry that they won't be believed that their pain is real because we can't measure it. But I want to say to you all today that it is okay to tell someone about your pain and we'll talk about some of the strategies for talking to your doctor about this. I might also add that pain can be stressful for patients and doctors. Doctors want their patients to be comfortable and to not have pain. And for patients, this can be an experience that really changes their life. So despite all the challenges though that we've talked about here, I think there are a lot of things that we can do to help relieve pain. And from there, let's go ahead and jump in to talk about some of those things we can do. And again, thank you so much. Continue to keep on asking questions. Uh, this is very uh, helpful for us and feel free to vote for the questions that uh, are most interesting to you. So how do we relieve pain? And how we perceive pain is complex, like we just described. And our brains can actually be very powerful in changing the way we feel pain. Things like attention or other emotional factors or even suggestion can have a major impact on how we experience pain. Let me just use an example of an athlete. So when an athlete is injured in the middle of an intense competition, they may actually feel less pain than someone who gets the exact same injury but isn't in the middle of an intense competition. The idea is that the athlete is distracted. They're thinking about their competition, not about their injury, and so they feel that pain a little bit less. Another example is that our, our minds are susceptible to suggestion. There have been studies where um, someone was given an injection of water, but told that it would cause pain, and the person would feel pain from it more than would be expected. And the opposite has been shown too, that people can get an injection of essentially water and be told that it will help relieve their pain, and people will feel relief of their pain. All the, these stories and these examples are just a way to say again that the, the brain has powerful ways to help us cope with pain that we experience, and it's an important part of the tools we can use in managing pain. So how do we relieve pain? And we talked about how pain can be complex. 
not only the nerves, but also the emotional and psychological component of pain. So we often have to take a complex approach to managing pain. And we'll talk through each of these tools. Our major tools are using medications, using psychological interventions, using integrative techniques, and addressing spiritual concerns. All of these things work together to really help pain, especially pain that's coming up from cancer. So in terms of medications, there are many options to help with pain. And for each person, it's important to talk with your doctor about which medications might be right for you. And certainly everyone's case can be unique. In general, I think about the medications we use on a balance between safety and side effects and the potential for benefit. In this figure, I've shown a pyramid. And in my mind, as you go up the pyramid, there are some increasing risks to the medications that we're using. However, it's really important to note that that doesn't necessarily mean that the risks outweigh the benefits. Sometimes people need stronger medicines to manage pain that is more severe. And that is okay and expected. I just wanna highlight, you may notice that opioids, which are medicines like morphine or oxycodone or hydrocodone, those medicines are at the top of this pyramid. That being said, many people living with cancer-related pain may need to use opioid medications, and your doctors can help to use these medications safely. I highlight opioids because I know that there's a lot of media attention right now about the opioid crisis in the United States. And I just wanna remind people that these are medicines that are a tool that we use to treat pain, and we use to treat cancer-related pain. And your doctors will be able to talk with you about how to use these in a safe way if that's needed for your case. As doctors, we also think about how these medicines work and what types of pain these medicines can relieve. We think about three broad categories of pain, nociceptive pain, which is really pain that's caused by injury uh, to tissue in the body. Neuropathic pain refers to pain that's caused by direct damage or injury to the nerves. And then inflammatory pain, which is due to inflammation. And so for any particular type of pain, we might pick a medicine that's in a different place on the pyramid because we think it will better treat that specific type of pain. Nerve-related pain or neuropathy is a great example of where we would pick something higher up in the pyramid because we think that that would work best for that type of pain. In addition, we often use a combination of medicines to help address the multiple types of pain that someone might be having. I wanna take a moment to speak about cannabis and I am by no means a cannabis expert, uh, but I do wanna just address this because I think it's a really common question that comes up for patients living with cancer. So cannabis or marijuana is FDA approved. Um, the medication form of cannabis is FDA approved for really two indications. One is for nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy. And the second is for appetite stimulation for people who are having poor appetite in advanced cancer. I will say that based on sort of my review of the literature and what I can see in terms of a research study is that there's not perfect clear evidence that cannabis is particularly helpful for pain. However, that being said, there are certainly many patient stories and people who have had personal experiences who get relief from cannabis products. So I think what I've seen is because of the limited scientific evidence, some doctors support the use of cannabis while others are more hesitant. In California, cannabis is legal for both medical and recreational use. So you actually don't need a doctor's note in order to purchase and use cannabis. If you are, oh, excuse me, if you are using cannabis, I do 
uh, recommend that you consider using tinctures rather than smoking or eating cannabis products. And then I recommend using very small doses and increasing very slowly over time. And again, your individual doctors can talk with you more about uh, their thoughts about cannabis, but those are some general, um, general thoughts. As we mentioned before, the mind has a really powerful influence over the way we experience pain. So we often recommend using strategies to maximize your ability to cope with pain. I think of this as a way to help make all the other treatments work a little bit better. Recommends this book that I featured here called the Opioid Free Pain Relief Kit. I looked and currently it's only available in English, but books similar to this that are about coping with pain can be really helpful in talking about meditation and relaxation techniques, talking through strategies for improving sleep, and advice about starting exercise and an activity program, all of which can help with coping with pain. I also wanted to highlight that UCSF's Integrated Medicine Center called the Osher Center also has a great website with lots of resources for guided imagery meditation, which can be a powerful uh, pain reliever. And then for some people, it's helpful for them to meet with a psychologist or a counselor to do more dedicated therapy in helping to live with and manage their pain. Things like cognitive behavioral therapy, or mindfulness-based stress reduction is another type of therapy. And then now more and more popular are smartphone applications like Calm or Headspace, which provide guided meditation. There are also thousands of calming meditation videos that are freely available on YouTube. So that's another place that is easy to find some guided imagery and guided meditation. Next, I wanted to take a moment to talk about integrative medicine, which has also been called complementary or, or alternative medicine. And it refers to approaches to improve pain that don't necessarily involve taking medicines. I would say for all of these interventions, uh, there's not necessarily an incredibly robust amount of research studies, but again, I've seen patients who can get incredible relief from some of these activities. Some of these things include like heating or icing or alternating between heat and ice, massage, acupuncture, aromatherapy, hypnotherapy, and Tai Chi. I would also say that spiritual care is also an important aspect of pain management. And I use spiritual care, the term broadly, because I think this really can apply to individuals, even if there's not a particular religion or faith that they follow. And spiritual care really can help address what we would call existential pain. I think of existential pain as suffering that can be caused when there are questions like, why did this happen to me? Or what is God's plan in all of this? Or even concerns about what happens if I get sicker or what happens after we die. Spiritual care providers or chaplains can often provide help by listening, having open-hearted conversations, providing just a calm presence, and offering prayers and blessings. With that, I just want us to move into our last section here about how to get help for your pain. And we'll provide some advice about talking to your providers about your pain. Again, keep on asking questions in the Q&A box and we'll, we look forward to getting to those here shortly. So as we've talked about before, I think there are many people who are concerned about talking with their doctors about their pain potentially out of fear that they may not be believed or to be seen as like they're seeking pain medicines. I just want to say that in general, when you have a cancer diagnosis, your doctors really should acknowledge and understand this is a condition that's known to cause pain. 
With that being said, I have a few words of advice that may help you to put your other doctors sort of in the best mind frame. I think it would be very reasonable to start by saying, I'm worried that cancer is causing my pain. Just to help them make that link that the pain you're having may be caused by your cancer. It also can be helpful for us as physicians to hear whether or not that pain is limiting your daily function. One of our goals in managing pain is to try to get people back to their prior level of functioning as much as possible. So if your pain is limiting, limiting you in some way, feel free to let your doctor know that your pain is not letting you be able to spend as much time with your children playing, for example. I would also encourage you to just to ask very openly, what can you do to help my pain? A very broad, open-ended question that lets your providers kind of consider all the different things in their toolbox that they could use. I'd also say it's very, very reasonable to ask if, you, if your doctor thinks that you should see a palliative care doctor or a pain management specialist. We can talk in a little bit about the difference between these two, but asking your doctor to tell them that you're okay seeing someone else that they feel like they need help in managing your symptoms, that's okay. Definitely feel free to use this talk as an excuse. You can say that you went to a talk from a palliative care doctor, and hopefully this was help, seemed helpful, and you can ask to get a referral. Some other advice when you're talking with your doctor about pain management is just to think about asking some questions that will help you take the best care of yourself that you can. So some questions to ask might include, who can you call if your pain is getting worse in between your visits? Is there a special person or number to call if it's after hours or on uh, weekends? You might also ask them what they would recommend if you were to have worsening pain and couldn't get a hold of them. Is there a first step they would like you to take in trying to improve your pain? And then also to ask them for advice about when to go to the emergency room or call 911 for pain. I just want to review some ideas about sort of where to go to get help if you are having pain. I would say the first place to go is to talk with the doctor who knows you best. That might be your general doctor or a primary care doctor, or it could be your cancer doctor, your oncologist. Those doctors may get things started and try both things that are medicines and non-medicine techniques to help you with your pain. And if you feel like you're not getting adequate relief from the things that they're trying, again, a very reasonable to ask for a referral to either a pain medicine specialist or to a palliative care team. Pain medicine specialist is another type of doctor. They tend to focus on managing pain primarily with medicines, as opposed to palliative care where we use medicines as well as sort of about the whole person and all the different components of pain uh, that there might be. There's no right or wrong and both types of specialists can be very helpful and we often work closely together. In some places, integrative medicine is uh, more readily available than others, but you can ask your other doctors if an integrative medicine specialist uh, is available in your, uh, in your health network. And then, I would also say that social workers and chaplains or the spiritual care team members can also help you advocate for helping manage your pain as well as helping to try to get you connected to uh, other specialists like palliative care. This is an incomplete list, but just an example of all the places where there are great palliative care teams throughout the Bay Area. Kaiser San Rafael, Marin General, the VA in San Francisco, as well as the VA in Palo Alto, UCSF, San Francisco General Hospital, the Kaiser System has palliative care throughout it, Sutter and Palo Alto Medical Foundation, as well as Stanford. So many places to get palliative care in the Bay Area. 
And with that, I just want to thank you all so much for your attention and really look forward to um, trying to address some of the questions that have come up. And I think with that, uh, Claire may come join us to help moderate Q&A. Yes, hi Grant. Um, why don't we get started because we have a lot of great questions. Before we started with the, with the questions that have the most votes, I wanted to let people know that yes, these slides will be sent to you and we are working to get them translated into Spanish and Chinese as well. Um, so the next questions that came up the most were about fasting before um, and after chemotherapy. Mm. People are wanting to know if um, you have any information about that mm. as they have heard that this can reduce side effects that are commonly associated with chemotherapy. Then somebody wrote, they were told that fasting right before chemotherapy may make it work better to kill more cancer cells. That is a really good question. And I have to be honest that I am actually not familiar with uh, that practice or the data around it. So I'm sorry that I, I unfortunately just am not going to be able to give you a, a very good answer. I have not had a lot of my patients tell me that they're doing this. So I also don't have a lot of experience with my patients giving me feedback about how that's gone for them. I would say in trying to help uh, answer this question, a good person to ask, in addition to your cancer doctors, would be a nutritionist. And many cancer centers and oncologists have uh, nutritionists as part of their teams. So I might, my best answer would probably be to refer you to someone who can give you a better answer. And if I can just add, this is Colleen from Bay Area Cancer Connections. This question has come up fairly regularly from our clients. We had a talk on it at our conference last year. Um, and we do have two PhDs on staff who have PhDs in things like cancer biology and molecular um, biology, and they can help answer or find um, research and things to help answer these questions. So feel free to contact our helpline. Great, thanks. We have a couple questions about exploring alternative therapies like acupuncture or naturopathy. Um, people are wondering how to find reputable practitioners experienced with cancer pain relief. Um, and I think there was also a question about, is there any research that discusses what types of alternative medicines like herbs may work for post survivorship side effects like hot flashes that continue to happen five years after? Yeah, great. Um, so in terms of finding reputable um, integrated medicine practitioners, certainly the center at UCSF, their Osher Center, is one that I'm aware of that's probably the most robust, at least in the Bay Area. And they may have additional resources for more community providers as well. Stanford also has an uh, integrated medicine program as well. I would say that outside of those two um, academic institutions, I'm not entirely sure, and it may vary quite a bit from one institution to another. But again, I think this is a very good question to ask about how to get connected within your network. And often the oncology folks could help to get you connected or the social workers that are a part of the oncology team might be able to help find more resources. I'll also see if our community partners may also have some other ideas that are uh, more in the community about where to get uh, integrated medicine uh, follow up. And there is the Charlotte Maxwell Clinic um, that does offer sliding scale complementary and alternative um, type of therapies. Um, and a few others as well. There's like the Oakland Acupuncture Project and some others so we can always help people with additional resources. Great, thank you, Colleen. Any advice people might have on best ways to bring up alternative medicine with your doctor to, to have that conversation? There was another question. Yeah, I think it's uh, very, very reasonable to bring it up. And often I think to 
as I think the person who wrote that question mentioned, that you're really hoping to add this on to, and just to clarify if you're thinking that you want this to be in addition to their cancer-directed therapy. I know some physicians may be hesitant if you're thinking about replacing sort of their oncology-directed treatment by integrative medicine. There could be some hesitation there, but I think there's a lot of open arms, much more so about adding this on as a uh, additional way to help with a particular symptom or issue you're having. Great. Um, we'll move to our next question, which is written in Chinese. And so, oh, um, so let's answer that question, then we'll get to the one about tinctures. Just So if our Chinese interpreters could interpret the question into English, then I'll reread it for everybody in English. So the question is about somebody who was diagnosed with breast cancer eight years ago, and um, they're still experiencing neuropathic pain all over their body. And I'm wondering what they can do about it. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. And you know, I do think bringing this up with your doctor would be really important. There are a lot of medicines that we have that can be helpful with neuropathic pain which is that nerve type pain, often kind of lightning bolt, stinging, shooting pain is the neuropathic pain we, we often think about. So there are a lot of different medicines that can help. And even some pain medicine specialists, there may be potential interventions like injections that could help with some of that pain. So I do think bringing this up with your, your doctors would be really helpful. And to ask them if they think that there are specific medicines for nerve pain that might be helpful for you. Okay, thanks. The next one is about what are tinctures? Can you define that a little bit better, a little bit more? Yes, thank you so much. So sorry for using that term and not defining it earlier. Uh, I was talking about tinctures when we were talking about cannabis. And a tincture is a cannabis product that's essentially dissolved in oil. And you take it um, basically in the mucosa or like in the cheek of the mouth. So it can basically be absorbed under the tongue. And um, the reason that I think that these can sometimes be beneficial is that they tend to start working fairly quickly, like within 45 minutes to an hour, and typically last for about six to eight hours. Whereas ingestible cannabis products sometimes can take up to two or two and a half hours to work and can last for more than 12 hours. So sometimes that's just a long time to get an effect and can last a lot longer than people necessarily would intend. Okay. And our next question is about Stanford Palliative Care. Do uh, the Stanford offer home visits? And if we don't, um, do we plan to provide home visits sometime down the road? Yeah, thank you so much for this question. And currently, Stanford Palliative Care does not offer home visits in the sense of having a nurse or a doctor come to the home. We have really expanded our telehealth and telemedicine services much like other folks around the country. Um, I personally would love for us to have a palliative care program at Stanford. And it's something that is sort of on people's minds, just uh, I think still a bit to, to get figured out. So I very much appreciate the, the question. And next we have a lot of questions with two votes each. So I'll just start at the top and go down. The first one is, what treatment options do you have for people who suffer pain from lymphedema? Maybe you could define what lymphedema is. Sure. Um, great question. Lymphedema just uh, refers to really swelling that's caused from a backup of the lymph nodes, which are part of our sort of immune systems. Um, so lymphedema, you know, certainly is sort of working as many strategies as we can to help with the actual lymphedema with things like gentle compression. 
However, I would say that just like the whole framework that we talked about before, that managing lymphedema, just like pain that's from an active cancer, really can sometimes take all, those, all the different aspects of managing pain. Lymphedema, I think in particular, can be challenging. It's not only physical pain, but your arm or leg or part of your body is swollen, which is, I think, psychologically can be very challenging. So I would say often using a mix of those medications that we had on the pyramid, while also thinking about addressing some of the psychological components, as well as trying your, our best to treat the lymphedema with things like compression, are some of the strategies that, that we use. Okay, and next is about the use of morphine. Some people are very against the use of morphine on their sick relative for fear of the patient being knocked out and not being able to be conscious enough to talk again. Is this a valid concern? Great question. Thank you so much for asking. I think this is on uh, probably more people's mind than who <laughs> uh, voted for the question. I hear this concern a lot. What I would say is that morphine, like any other medication that exists, has side effects. One of the potential side effects of morphine can be that it can be sedating or make people more sleepy. That being said, for people who are, there are people who use morphine who are going to live a very a long time, years, and they need morphine to manage their pain. We're often able to work closely with them to help find the right dose that provides them with pain relief without them being too sleepy. In some cases, and most often when someone is at the very end of life, they may have escalating pain and there may be trade-offs in some of the decisions we have to make, like having more pain relief may mean that someone's going to be more sleepy, but someone might be in a place where that's an acceptable trade-off to them. I think overall, fortunately, those cases are quite rare. We're often able to have people's pain be pretty well controlled and to have them be fairly alert. We also have a lot of tools in our toolbox, in addition to morphine or any other opioid, that can sometimes help provide pain relief without having side effects of sedation. Things like using Tylenol or ibuprofen, as well as some interventional procedures like injections uh, that can sometimes provide more relief. Thanks. This next one, it says, when a patient is near the end of life and unable to talk or make motions, how do we tell if he or she is in pain? How do we read his or her pain signals? Great, thank you for this question too, an excellent question. And you know, we definitely can use uh, nonverbal ways of monitoring for pain. And in fact, there are even nonverbal pain scales that are used. Practically when I am helping to assess someone who may be in the last stage of their life and they're not able to vocalize or tell us if they're in pain, I look for some of those nonverbal signs one of the main ones is just how does their face look? And in particular, I often look right in between their eyes at their brow. And when someone is relaxed, often there's kind of no wrinkles, it's very smooth, a relaxed face. When people are uncomfortable, even if they're not able to verbally respond, you may see what I'm trying to do here, but scrunching up of the brow, we call this furrowing, looking like they're holding some type of distress in their face. So I look at that. I also look at their breathing pattern to see is their breathing really, really fast, which is often uncomfortable, or if it looks like they're having to have a lot of work in their breathing, they're putting a lot of effort or using a lot of muscles. All that's to say that even when people aren't able to vocalize, we sometimes can take a look at them as a whole and see, does it look like they're holding tension or pain in their face? Does their breathing look comfortable or not? And that can sometimes help us get a sense of whether or not having pain. Great, thanks. 
Next um, question, an attendee writes, I think it would be helpful for monolingual patients to have a list of questions they can ask during their appointments. They can share these with their caregivers so they can ask these questions. Is there a list that can be printed online? It would be great to have these in Spanish and other languages. And maybe our partners um, can jump in here too. I, I'll just quickly say while other folks may be formulating some thoughts is that I don't know of a specific resource like this. I would say it's always great to come prepared to your physician visits with questions uh, just to help make sure we're doing a good job of communicating and having questions prepared can help us sort of bridge, especially if there is a language or a cultural barrier to make sure we're kind of connecting as best as possible. But I will see if uh, any of the community partners uh, and co-hosts have thoughts about other resources for kind of questions to ask your uh, provider that might be in other languages. Hi, yes, so um, I would recommend to anybody that has uh, questions like this and wants to plan to meet with their physicians and ask these questions, to maybe contact the cancer support organization that you use. So if you're not already connected with one, you can connect with any of us that are helping to co-host. And our counselors can help create these lists. And if we need them to be translated, we can go ahead and do that translation so the questions can be asked in the appointment. The other suggestion is to ask for interpretation during your appointment. Um, most healthcare organizations should offer that opportunity so that you can fully communicate uh, with your physicians and your care team. That's really important. Hi, this is Darcy with Latinos Contra Cancer. I just wanted to offer to that question. We do case, um, sorry, there's a toddler in the background. We do, we do case management. And some of that includes preparation for appointments. So um, we just kind of will talk through with our clients some of the questions that they might be able to ask with their doctors. We have prep meetings. Um, we offer this in English and in Spanish. So if anyone needs help with that, just kind of meeting with us ahead of time, getting the concerns down on paper, and then coming up with questions you might be able to ask. We, um, we're happy to help. Thank you so Thank much. You. I see that we have just about a minute left too. So maybe we could take one more question, but also wanted to give our co-hosting sponsors too, just time if you have other comments you want to make before we, before we wrap things up. Maybe Claire, why don't we take one more question and then we'll turn it over and see if co-hosts want to uh, Great. add anything. Sure. Okay, so what response do you suggest to a doctor who says, you are hyper aware, most people don't notice that about pain. It feels dismissive to me. Yeah, I have to say reading that comment, um, that I share that sentiment, it does feel dismissive. You know, I, I would just suggest to try to really remind them that this is your experience and that, like we said, these symptoms are subjective and that we don't have something to measure that and to remind them of what you're going through. Uh, but I'm sorry you've experienced that and it may be something where if you feel comfortable that if it's a symptom that you know you feel like you're having and not getting a lot of help with that asking for a referral to talk with a palliative care specialist or a pain specialist if pain is the symptom you know that would be very reasonable. With that, I might just thank everyone so much for uh, coming to this event. It really has been a pleasure. And I just wanted to turn it over to our co-hosting organizations to see if they have other um, sort of parting words. I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Smith, and thank you to all the other co-hosting organizations for making this possible, and thank you all for joining us today. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, everyone. It's really nice to be here and to have those uh, very good information. Thank you. Okay.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this. I think this was really helpful for all of us. And um, I hope everybody was able to get some good information. I think I learned a lot too. So thank you guys for joining us. All right, well, thank you everyone. So great to be able to join you all. Are there any 